For centuries, dogs were the key to surviving in the Northwest Territories. But times have changed. The capital, Yellowknife, is a modern city, not a prospecting settlement anymore. The partnership between dogs and humans has changed, here and all over the Northwest Territories. Many dogs come to a sad end. But people all over the territory are finding unique ways to help, protecting dogs and helping them find new roles in the new north. Yellowknife is a very close-knit community. It's, uh, very, it's, a, it's like a family here. The uh, long cold winters and short days, they kind of bring people together. It's the end of the road. When you're driving the road Yellowknife, that's the place you're going. It's a tough life out here. I mean, uh, when you've got minus 40 and minus 50 and all these strays, if a female is tied on outside, if she gets off her chain, she runs around, she gets pregnant. It's so expensive to get your dog spay or neutered, so people in the communities can't afford that. Everything in the Northwest Territories is very isolated. There's uh, very few communities that you can get into by road. Um, most of them are fly-in, and uh, for somebody to get a dog out for spay and neuter, I mean, is, is very expensive. Um, it's, a, it's a flight in and a flight out, plus the vet bill. There's an overpopulation of dogs. Um, the, the popular thing to do and probably the cheapest thing to do is to collect them and shoot them. In Yellowknife, a group of hard-working volunteers want to avert this tragedy, and their efforts are bearing fruit. It will be a the start of construction a on the first SPCA animal shelter in the Northwest Territories. Way. So take your time to thank your neighbor Thank your colleague, your local businesses, for all their help and contributions. The town gathers to celebrate. Today we're at the next step in a project that started well over a year ago. The Aviva uh, Insurance Company had sponsored a competition. And if you were enthusiastic enough and got enough votes, you could get some money, and they were lucky. They got $300,000 from that. And now it's been a matter of bringing together other sponsors within the community, in the construction industry, foundations in, now we need some walls. This whole thing started by the former vice president of the SPCA here, sent me an email and it kind of just snowballed from there. And so it got crazy. <laughs> it got really crazy. Um, there was an online competition um, put on by an insurance company where anybody that, uh, who were an advocate for a cause could put in an application to enter. Um, they would enter into rounds of voting where anybody in the general public or across the world could jump online and vote for, for their cause. And uh, that's when I called them up and asked them if I could take over the campaign. And uh, she said, go for it, and gave me free reins, and I ran with it. So, I mean, it, we need an animal shelter for a number of reasons. What are we, I don't know, 12-hour drive away from probably any other shelter? Plus the, the harsh climates we have, minus 40, minus 50 in the winter, they just won't survive. <laughs> Wade last year was a huge part of the Aviva campaign. I don't think we would have won if it wasn't for him. 
um, getting people to vote and putting flyers on cars and signs up everywhere and just being this big energy, the push that we needed to get this in the spotlight. It's been a broadcast on over the radio all day. We even had a local DJ dressed as a woman and run down the main street. Every day they say, come on, did you vote? Did you vote? So, of course, well, then you got into it then. And, of course, well, we, you knew we wanted a shelter. Everybody wanted, uh, wanted to, to see a shelter. Remind everybody before coffee, did you vote today? I phoned my friends in Newfoundland and got them set up to vote, and my friends in British Columbia, and a relation in Ontario. And tell you once, tell you twice, please donate to the SPCA. I think anybody that wasn't deaf in Yellowknife had to hear about the SPCA last fall because it was in the papers all the time and on the news. And, and I think to see that we had that much support from, from Yellowknife and the communities and whoever voted for us, uh, it was pretty incredible. I, uh, it was on cloud nine. The shelter is in the midst of being built. Um, we still need about, I think, 50 or $60,000. So we're really excited. We're hoping it's going to be finished by the spring. Today, we've got, uh, I've got my girl Misty out here uh, over there with my friend Tia. And Tia's two dogs, Toad and Picea. And uh, we've got two pound dogs here today, Midge and uh, and Paulina, and uh, Midge here is uh, one year old. She uh, was a stray that was picked up and brought out to the pound, and and uh, her five days that they, they hold her there has expired, and she's looking for a new home now. And uh, same with Paulina over there. I do a lot of fostering for the SPCA when they've got dogs that uh, are high energy or have aggression issues. They'll usually give me a shout, and. I'll help out. A lot of the ones that I've taken on came right from death row. They were slated to be put down. A couple of them have been slated to put, be put down the day that I took them. And uh, I usually work with them for, for a couple months and uh, until we can find them a good home. So, yeah. At present, the local veterinary hospital fills in until the SPCA shelter is up and running. Stray dogs are impounded here until they find a home or can be sent south to other animal rescue groups. Volunteers drop in, socialize with the dogs, and take them for much needed walks. <laughs> I have a dog. Um, it's already had a litter. I told the owner today, if you come today okay. and you pay the bill, she can be yours. Uh, if you don't come today, then we're going to have to make other arrangements. So we'll just eat the costs um, of vaccinating her and spaying her and, uh, and sending her down south to hopefully find a better yesterday. life. But we'll see. Uh, we'll see today. Um, the bill is currently, I think, at $460. So we'll see what they say. For many years, Dr. Tom Peach operated the only full-time veterinary clinic and hospital in the entire Northwest Territories. Okay, so we have Stevie here. Yeah. This is the second uh, booster for Stevie, and we're going to give him a rabies vaccination today. We should probably stop. <clears throat> Be careful for another couple of weeks, uh, not expose her to uh, stray dogs. A lot of people in the vet systems feel that the dog should be up to date on vaccines for its health and to stop the spread of diseases um, and then to help with the population. And uh, this is the, uh, the terrible problem because we have to, we ending up with these dogs here and we try to adopt them. The city pays for five days. The dog could be adopted next day and could be adopted next year. It's too many dogs, it's impossible. I really 
cute. I kind of want to take them all home. So how did we get to this sorry situation where many dogs, through no fault of their own, become victims instead of working partners? Images of dogs are everywhere in Yellowknife. They are iconic, celebrated. Without them, there would be no history here. Many Northerners still keep dogs because they can't imagine life without them around. Until very recently, they were the essential beast of burden, just like the horse further south. Like, it was a complete fluke. I had no idea I'd lucked in on the end of an era, not realizing that right around the corner it was about to disappear. All of a sudden, life was changing in the north. And yeah, and it's very recent history. This was all shacks along the shore. There was a dog team right in behind us here. Charlie Saunders, who was an old fella, had a team tied right in the bushes right there. And then this was, uh, the docks weren't here, but there were a lot of boats. Uh, this was called Lou's Beach. And there was a lot of boats here, all just randomly pulled up. And that was Dog Island out there. That's, uh, there's always dogs there as long as I knew. I eventually put my dogs out there every summer when I lived here in the woodyard because they were safe out there. There was more of a breeze, less bugs. It was a bit of a nuisance for feeding, but, and then we called that second Dog Island because sometimes there were dogs on it. And then there was uh, the point here. There was always dogs down in the willows on the point. In this day and age, you don't really have to have dogs as your only source of transportation. There are options. When, you know, 30 years ago, there weren't actually options. It was, um, if you wanted to go somewhere, you better get some dogs. You know, if you have no food and you need to go hunting and you need to get go 30 miles to find the caribou, well, you're gonna go with your dogs and if they can't get you there, you've got a real problem. We went trapping. So they were our transportation and they were the only thing I trusted. I knew that if I took the dogs, I would come home, you know, and that I knew that they weren't going to desert me either because Pogi, the leader, was like my faithful sidekick. You know, she would do anything I said within, as long as she could understand me, and she was always going to get me home. So I could travel all by myself out there. We were 50 miles from town out in the street east of here. I could travel around on my own, and really, it, I wasn't really worried about it. I felt quite confident, you know. <laughs> Many Northerners keep dogs to keep the tradition alive. Scott McQueen's father was a trapper who had a special way with them. A lot of times they had to depend on, on the dogs to survive and the dogs' knowledge of what to do or where to go. These dogs, they weren't like the pet dogs we have nowadays. Um, they tried to breed the wolf into their dogs because they needed big, strong dogs to work on the trap line. They needed dogs that were going to help them to survive in, in a really harsh northern environment. Um, and you couldn't have pet dogs out in the bush like that. You know, you could sometimes you'd look at a bunch of pups and you think, yeah, not too many generations ago, that, that one of their ancestors was a wild animal. And they tended to be... Um, a little, the personalities were just different. Regardless of how you would raise them, they would have been different than a Labrador Retriever or something. Um, you know? Even when they're being raised, this young, this young litter of pups, they're, they're, they're not playing, off playing with the kids. You know, they're kept separate from, from the kids. and um, they, they don't want them to be trained as, as pet dogs. They want them to be trained more in their natural instincts, more like a, like a pack of wolves. The trappers would, would try to work with those instincts of their dogs to, to help train them. This is a type of the dog uh, which uh, uh, is more traditional than uh, than modern. Like he's uh, he's more like a uh, husky type. So it's a Siberian. Yeah, it's a Siberian uh, husky. Uh, so this dog can stand uh, cold weather and this tough, but he's, he probably won't be as fast as a racing horse dog, but he will be much tougher. You know, like the working dogs, they could eat every two days. 
Modern dogs are not that kind of dogs, you know, they don't survive that. Okay, we have to turn him around. No, yeah, there's another back. Yeah, turn him around. Where is Liam? This guy is an old. Also, they play feist. They got very strong survival instincts. They fight for food, they fight for female, they fight for uh, who is the dominant. I mean, all dogs do that, but uh, the more uh, those traditional kind of uh, ASCII breeds, they tougher, they fight more. And sometimes I go over, especially when it was really hot, and I had about usually 10 dogs or so. And they're all nice dogs, you know, and I'd think, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to be nice, I'm going to turn them all loose so they can go swimming. Well, all that happened would be I'd have a huge fight and then I'd tie half of them back up and I'd leave the other half loose and then they wouldn't go in the water so I'd throw them in the water so they'd cool off and then they'd all get grumpy and they'd go and attack the ones that were tied up and it was just, <laughs> you know, I tried to be really nice and give them a summer vacation. It never really worked out all that well. Winter excitement begins with Skidoo. The light-footed snowmobile that's fast, frisky, wonderful fun. My dad said around 1970, uh, his brother Ray Beck got the first snowmobile in, in uh, Fort Resolution. But he didn't trust the snowmobile uh, to go out on the land and be fully dependent on it. And so he trained his dogs to follow behind the snowmobile. And uh, so he would head out on the trap line and the snowmobile would be in front and the dogs were, were coming in behind. And, the, and these trap lines, like my dad's, it's 200 miles, 150 miles away from the nearest town. So it's a long ways away to be stranded with a piece of machinery. And that was the model in particular that a lot of people in the bush used because it was cheaper and it was light. And you could like pick it up and throw it onto an airplane. You could throw it into your boat. And then as skidoos got better, people would come into town. We'd have to come to town to make money to buy the skidoo for starters because trapping, you never really made a huge amount of money. And then people discovered they could trap from town because you could go on a weekend, you could go 100 miles, check your traps and come back. And people started to trap from town instead of living in the bush. And then the dogs just sort of became redundant. The old ways have passed, but tradition lives on through a new and fulfilling kind of partnership that benefits both dogs and people. Oh, you were such a good boy today. You were such a good boy. Yeah. My name's Ashley McDonald and I run Canada Dog Pet Camp and Boarding. People will drop their dogs off with me when they're going out of town or on vacation. It's doggy daycare and long-term boarding. When I was living my last year in Winnipeg, I noticed online that there was a kick sledding workshop and I thought, well, what's kick sledding? A kick sled is about 18 pounds and it folds right down and kick sleds were originally used without dogs attached to them but then someone in Canada thought well we can attach dogs to this. One or two dogs and pet dogs that's the thing like just pet dogs are just fine for this but it's so much fun. As soon as I was doing it I wanted more of it and I wanted more of it so here I am now a dog musher two years later. My kennel also houses my sled dog team, so it's a recreational team, meaning I dog sled for fun. I'm not worried about entering races or winning races. It's just purely for fun. My dogs are all sled dog misfits sort of thing. <laughs> This is Chipmunk. You'll notice after seeing all my other sled dogs that she's actually the smallest dog, but great things come in small packages and she will tell everybody else what to do.
hospital. I put a call out on Facebook saying that they were faced with perhaps having to euthanize, so put some dogs down because of a lack of space. So I had decided, well, I'll keep one kennel open at all times for a foster dog. So they chose Titan. So he came in as this really fearful, skittish dog. His teeth were all broken from the life he had led, and they were yellow. His fur, even though he's a white dog, it had more of a yellowish tinge. And within weeks, I always say, he just developed this ear-splitting grin, and it hasn't left his face. So here's a dog that never was shown what love is, was never shown that you know this relationship that you can have with people is a wonderful thing, man's best friend. And so he started to realize what that was like and he's just got so much love to give and it's so amazing to me because he's got no reason to give that love. He was, had this horrible life for quite a long time and then we just cracked that shell and gave him the chance and he's this big sweetie. <laughs> And it's not to give them necessarily nutrition, it's more so that we know that they're going to drink this because it tastes so darn good to them. So this is Hex, he's an Alaskan Husky. And you'll notice that all the sled dogs are on chains. And some people might think that that's cruel. But the idea here is, is that I can bait all my dogs individually. And so I can measure how much they're drinking individually. And also we check the dog's pee. Cause you can tell how dehydrated a dog is by the color of their pee. So it's really important that they do spend time at their own individual dog houses. So we can monitor how um, much they're eating and drinking and thus how they can keep themselves warm. They don't stay on their chains all day. Usually we bait them, they eat and drink, and then they have this huge yard to run around and play in. So I know if you've never seen this sort of setup, and this is traditionally how sled dogs are kept, it can be a bit shocking. But let me tell you that these are the happiest huskies you're gonna meet. One dog puts its nose up in the air and then within minutes, you'll have 30 dogs howling and it's a beautiful sound and they sit on top of their dog houses and noses up to the moon just like you would imagine and sometimes one yard will start it then the next kennel starts and the next kennel goes with hundreds and hundreds of huskies howling together at the same time so you're far from your home but i won't let you down we got ways way up north i'll carry Saving dogs in the city of Yellowknife is hard enough. In remote communities in the far north, it is even harder. Luckily, there are dedicated volunteers who rise to the challenge in one of the harshest environments in the world. When I started the campaign, um, we didn't even have land to build the shelter. As of now, the frame is up, there's a roof up, um, the walls are up, so, but we're still short on money, so we're, we're looking for more money to finish it. If we had a shelter, it would serve as many things, as an educational component, so it would be somebody's job to go to schools and go to communities and teach them how important it is to spay and neuter and how to interact in a positive way with dogs. And then we would have the capacity that when these dogs are caught in the communities and wandering around, there's a place for them to go that's safe. If the dog is, is built to be outside, if it's a husky, if it has lots of fur um, and it has proper housing, there's nothing wrong with a dog, a certain type of dog to be outside. But a lot of dogs, like my dog Gia, she can't be outside 
in minus 25, she starts lifting up her paws and she has short fur, so there's no way she would survive a few days out in minus 35. She'd, she'd definitely die. In Nuvik, up way up north, they have it much worse than we do, because at least we have a vet here and um, we have a road that goes out. Our new Vic is more isolated. It's only, I think, four or 5,000 people, I think. Bylaw officers Kevin Keens and Dan Brown have to manage the dog population in a new Vic. So the dog was okay? They no, are on so their way to pick up an unwanted male dog. Heat running loose with several male dogs chasing them. A lady wants to surrender her, her dog. It's a small, couple month old pup. And uh, we'll pick that up. Apparently he's a, uh, he's a little bit of a chewer yeah. and he's been chewing on some stuff and she yeah. hasn't got time to, uh, to train him and, and to do it properly. So, you know, I told her we'll make every effort to either adopt the dog out here locally or around town or send it to Edmonton. There we go. Go for a little ride. We mostly see uh, labs, black labs, uh, retrievers, um, and then you'll see uh, small indoor dogs like Shih Tzus and Pugs and Chihuahuas. It was pretty funny because I had a Chihuahua and I had a Great Dane and the same person adopted both of them. Like the Chihuahua used to be running around the Great Dane's leg, legs and the Great Dane would be licking it and kind of knocking it over and playing with it and stuff and it was pretty funny. <laughs> That's so cute. One more. Just a little love muffin. Looking for that forever home. <laughs> and I him? Linda and Greg moved their family to Inuvik 12 years ago. They've been working to save dogs ever since. With so much need and so few fosters, there is rarely a dull moment. I have a puppy at my house right now who um, one of the nurses from uh, Fort McPherson brought in and she took it off the street and got it healthy and now it's in my house running around here somewhere and it'll be here for a few days until we can book a flight and get it set up in one of the uh, rescue groups. The other morning I got a call from a lady in town and her dog had 11 pups. Um, I got a call right after that again. Uh, there was a woman who had two dogs, a pup and an adult dog that she couldn't keep so she needed to send them out. So in two days there was 19 dogs that had to go out. That's the way it is here. So Greg, bless his heart, was trained by the vet um, a number of years ago to euthanize quietly the animals that we can't keep. And it's very difficult and it's, it takes somebody with strength and compassion. Because of the dog program, the relocation program, um, it's less and less that we put down in a month. It, it yeah. sometimes now is a dog in four months yeah, yeah. instead of uh, six dogs every mm -hmm. 10 days. Dan and Kevin are bringing uh -oh. the surrendered lab to the uh, pound, yeah. where he will stay until he can take a flight down south. Oh, what's that? Go see what that is. Let's go see. So now we have a, a building for the pound dogs, and we send our dogs through the SPCA to Yellowknife. First Air Canadian North uh, is the only way to get dogs out of here. First Air is our corporate sponsor, so they give us 50% off of everything, which is a huge deal because it, it's so expensive to ship cargo. There's lots of logistics, there's lots of, you know, finding pl uh, space on the plane. If there's space to send a, a large dog or, you know, three crates or two crates, just the logistics of all that is crazy. Let's see if we can get Nicole to tell us what's going on. We're going to try to send out a pup today um, on first stair down to Yellowknife for adoption. Sorry. Nicole, hi, love, it's Lindy here. Hi. Huh. Good. Listen, we're just getting ready to um, make preparation for that pup to go down. We wondered if First Air was aware that it's flying out today. Oh, okay, not to worry. I've got to go, but I'll um, I'll be in touch with you. Okay. 
All right, thanks, Nicole. Okay, bye. All right, she's um, quite happy to help us. Nice. Yeah. Way to go, honey. Yeah. Good morning. Another one down the road. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Usually with us, things happen last minute, so it's a big scramble. And our foster parents are phenomenal because they, they know how everything happens so quickly and they have, you have to be flexible and, and if you're not flexible, it's just not going to work. I don't think that, um, I don't think we would have got half of what we got done this year if uh, Nicole hadn't been in the picture. They've taken on a lot of our animals, um, which probably would not have made it. They might have been put down. So there's thousands of dogs like that in New York. Thousands. Good dogs. Gentle dogs. How many times do like dogs that we've sent down south that I call Northern Specials, um, people have emailed me and said, this dog that I took from the north, it's the best dog I've ever had. It's sad, and some people say, how can you do it? And it's like, well, if I can save one, if I can save two, um, then we'll probably get another five or six down this week. It's about being kind and humane, and that's a big thing with getting a shelter here, is that we need to help as many dogs and cats um, as possible and give them a chance. Another kind of dog lover is rechanneling the dog's working instincts into a highly competitive sport. Sled dog racing is often a family affair, and it has spawned a new generation of mushers and a prestigious new role for Northern Dogs. For as long as there have been dogs in the north, there have probably been dog races. But over the last several decades, competitive dog sled racing has gained huge popularity. And this is good for dogs and their future in the north. And so in 1955, um, the Yellowknife Fish and Game Association started a race in, in Yellowknife. They called it the Canadian Championship Dog Derby. Because dogs were, were so important to northern people, having the best dog team was um, a lot of prestige to that. It started off as a smaller race and gradually grew and attracted more and more people from around Great Slave Lake every year. Uh, people came from south of the lake and uh, all around. And it kind of grew till it hit 50 miles a day and eventually became a 50 mile, three day event, 50 miles a day. And I think in 1974 or so, it, it had like, I think the most teams we ever had was 32 teams showed up and they came from down south for the first time. A Bunch of teams drove up and uh, it was quite an event and they brought things like racing sleds with them. Everyone here used toboggans. 
And it was kind of considered that these guys were cheating with these racing sleds. But you know, about two years later, everybody had a racing sled. Jordy McQueen came to racing through her father, Scott, and Scott's father, who was a champion dog racer. Your grandpa wanted you to be a dog racer? And so I told Papa, no, I'm not going to spend that much for a seven-year-old's racing sled. <laughs> and so he, he says, OK, well, bring me to the bank then. I'm going to spend that. <laughs> and so I said, OK, I guess I have no choice but to buy this sled for my seven-year-old daughter, a thousand bucks. This was top of the line at the it time? It was top of the line, yeah. It was the best racing sled you could get. Wow. And that's what Papa wanted. <laughs> the sleds today are made um, using uh, basically a pair of um, cross-country skis and then they have a, a very lightweight frame attached to that. But not really wood anymore, right? No wood in it, no. It's all lightweight um, metals. She's probably uh, a 50% hound and a 50% husky. So these pups would be probably around a, a 3 8 hound or something. Come here. Like the sleds, Modern racing dogs have also changed a lot right, from the Huskies of 50 years ago. What they used to race with was just the uh, trapline dogs, though, eh? And my dogs, uh, like you saw them, they're all thin-coated. Minus 25, minus 24, I'll have to put a jacket on them just to run them. And if you noticed, all my, uh, my dog houses are insulated, so... And then they got a layer of straw that they sleep in, so... They're quite comfortable sleeping in those little houses. And they'll run anywhere from uh, 18 mile an hour to 22 mile an hour. And uh, long ago, your dogs is probably 14 mile an hour dogs is what you had. They were more built for uh, like pulling heavy loads and whatever, now you want speed. A few years ago, there's a guy that's from Sweden. He lives in Alaska. And he's originally from Sweden and he moved to Alaska. And he uh, brought all these hounds with them to come and race against all the huskies. And he, sorry to say, but he kicked everybody's ass for how many years? So everybody started breeding into them, so. Andrew Charlie lives in a Klavik, 1,000 miles northwest of Yellowknife. Everything costs more up here, so the community finds unique ways to support Andrew's team. So that's the catch of the day there. <laughs> yeah, right now they have a fishing derby, which is benefits me. Everybody brings, I'm the one, the only ones with dogs in town, so they'll bring it to me. I usually break off the heads because they got big bones in them, yeah. like long bones, and uh, I mean the dogs will chew it, but okay, throw those two in. Don't let it splash on you though. Like if I was going traveling or whatever, like to Yellowknife, yeah. I'll cook up my fish and whatever I add to it, my rice, yeah. and then I'll bag them. And then it's a lot easier to throw in a bucket in a hotel room to thaw out. And, uh, and all I'll do is add uh, beef to it. So that's my beef, that's ground up beef. They come in blocks of 50 pound blocks. More people dropping off fish, free fish. By Christmas, Great Slave Lake is locked in thick ice. Temperatures are plummeting to minus 30 and below. But nothing short of a blizzard will stop the racing trials to select who will compete in the Arctic Winter Games held in Whitehorse in the spring. Grant Beck is a race organizer and was a champion dog racer himself for many years. They'll be marked. And on the way home, there'll be another marker half half a mile from the finish, the free zone. So when the, the team, team is, catches another team, you have, to, you have to pass, call for trail. Scott McQueen is here with his son, Tolson. Once you get into the free zone, then you have to. Competitive dog sled racing is a big commitment of time, effort, and money. So it's usually a family affair. They come from all over the Northwest Territories and from all walks of life. Questions about the rules, about the race. 
I think we're going to sign up for registration and make the draw for the race starts, and away we go. Taylor. Number. Four. Number four. Andrew. Two. So going out with bib number two will be Andrew Charlie. Bib number three, Tulsa McQueen. Bib Almost like a big four. family meeting when you have these races here, particularly at the Winter Games. Rebecca Baxter. Rebecca's won a couple North American 17. Championships and placed second twice at the World Championships as a junior. How do you think you're going to do this week? Um, it's going to be tough because we have a lot of competition, but I'm just going to try my hardest and also have fun and hopefully have a great time. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, go! Andrew Charlie and his son wax the sled runners before the race. No detail is overlooked. In a race decided by the clock, every second counts. Their hard work behind them, it is time to race. As the last racers go, the early starters are on the home stretch. Oh, I've seen a great race. They had a good time, good fast uh, race, good trail. Um, the weather is great. Everybody seems to be happy. <laughs> My uh, boy had his uh, trials for Arctic Winter Games. He came in second on the first day, and then uh, he came in first on the last day, and he was uh, second overall, so that automatically qualified him for the Arctic Winter Games. Basically, leave everything at home. You forget about all your, what you do at work, and it's just uh, a soothing feeling, I guess, when you're running dogs. It makes you calm and relaxes you, I guess. So. Dogs have their individual personalities like people. And so when you do spend that much time with them, training a team, so you really get close with them and you get to learn their individual personalities and their quirks. And that part, loving dogs so much, was really special to me. It is a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. Andrew Charlie's son went on to win two silver medals at his first Arctic Winter Games in March 2012. The race is over, 
But Scott's work continues. It is more important than ever for people to understand the ancient partnership between people and dogs. Ashley McDonald adopted Titan, another sled dog misfit to add to her team. SPCA volunteers all over the territory continue the struggle to save dogs. The new SPCA shelter in Yellowknife is close to finished, and the fundraising goes on. promotion here for the SPCA and tell you once tell you twice please donate to the SPCA thank you